But I'll tell you what, Jim, let's talk about wrestling's past. Always a depressing time of year. The oh, return no. of Dark Side of the Ring. No, come on. Now, don't Looking at darkness like everywhere they could find it. No. In every nook and cranny of the wrestling business. <laughs> they're there with a flashlight that they will turn off as soon as they spot any darkness to capture the darkness. <laughs> and they return with another sad and dark episode. <laughs> Cute Looking thing. at a wonderful man who had a very sad story they told with the most dramatic and sad music they could find. Uh, <sighs> Dark Side of the Rings back, Jim. Look at Jesus. It sounds like uh, Husney, Husney and Eisner, proctologists. They've got the, the flashlight going into the dark crevices to find the dark sides of things. No, I, I, I can't wait for the reenactment of someone stubbing their toe. Oh, come on. They're looking for things to reenact now at this point. They're just looking for anything they can. Well, Why don't we do this? It, there weren't cameras up everybody's ass in those days. See, now there's footage of everything. <laughs> but you got to reenact some of these things because everybody didn't have a camera up their ass back in those days. And we're making light here. But it was, it was a... You have to admit, I told you ahead of time because I saw it before you did. It was Earthquake John Tenta was the season premiere. And I told you it was so sad. And then when I spoke to you after you'd seen it, you agreed with me. that it, and, and it wasn't, it's a, a kinder, gentler episode of Dark Side of the Ring in that in a lot of cases, the subject or principal person being profiled or however you want to phrase it, is of somewhat of their own making they had troubles they there, there's some culpability people could say well you know in some aspects so and so brought such and such on themselves but john tenta was a wonderful guy of great talent for the time that he had in the business and you know, what a family. The family is just the the daughter and the sons and the wife, just you fall in love with them. So it was a it was even though it was a sad ending, obviously, because he passed away early of cancer, it was still it, it was it, it, he deserved his story told and for these wonderful people to get a chance to be on television. Now take the piss out of it. Okay. Sound like a big prick. I thought it was great to hear Earthquake's story here. I'm Brian Last. <laughs> I'm the co-host of Jim Cornette Experience. And I also really thought that it was a nice story. Let me go to another person who's going to do their introduction right now. And this, sometimes it's just nonstop introductions of people. I'm Jake the Snake Roberts. Everyone knows who the fuck I am. Everyone knows who these people are, but whatever. I, oh, there goes my phone. <laughs> people are calling, people are texting, multiple people. Everything's blowing up, which has nothing to do with Dark Side of the Ring. Um, the question was there. It was asked. Yes. What was the question? <laughs> no, uh, I'm not going to take the piss out of the whole thing. Look, I'm not a fan of their production style and some of the choices they make. But in terms of story, it was a nice story to hear. And, you know, it's nice. He was a really memorable character. From the moment he debuted, and they immediately got him away from the Ultimate Warrior for one reason or another. <laughs> he was a memorable character for people my age growing up. And it is sad when you see all the WCW stuff laid out. I just, you couldn't yeah. call him Earthquake. Avalanches, eh, I mean, almost acceptable. The Shark, no. I mean, that one promo I remember ever since I was a kid. I'm not a shark. I'm not a fish. <laughs> like rarely as a wrestler had to deny that they were a fish yes on television well but at least that was still better than golga we, we'll, we'll oh. get that in a second but the point is and and by the way yes i know you you are are too much of a factition uh, uh fanatic to enjoy the reenactments and the hazy murkiness and etc cetera, etc cetera. but one of these days they'll be reenacting me and you and they'll just have to put a big fucking blob up because nobody will know what you look like. So it'd be one of those blurred fucking... Then they can reenact when they get served. <laughs> Bop! Yep, that's how we'll do it. Anyway, back to John Tenta. No, I thought he was a wonderful guy. I got to work with him some in the WWF in that period of time in the early mid-90s and late 90s, unfortunately, Golga. But he was still a wonderful person. And... 
the one thing that I had never realized, and I just, I guess if I'd seen it in print, I didn't pay attention. Being around him and seeing him from the time, you know, we got the, I got the Japanese tapes in the, in the eighties. So I saw him when, and he debuted to a lot of fanfare over there because of his sumo background. I was getting the magazines. I didn't realize I'm older than he was because he, he, not only he was one of those guys, a wrestler of the old days where he looked older than he was, but also he went bald or balding in the front or however you phrase it prematurely. I'm not trying to denigrate him, but, and, and just being so fucking big, you know, you were, oh, he's a kid next to me standing here at six foot seven or whatever the fuck. But I'm like two years older than him. I did not know that. But I thought they did a good job for the, you know, the basically American audience that knows him mostly from WWF and then some WCW of telling the story of him in Japan because you weren't around at, concurrently in real time, as the kids say. But he was a, a, he made a lot of news when he transitioned from sumo to pro wrestling in Japan. He was a big deal in the magazines and, so uh, the tape traders, smart fans, newsletter readers, such as they were at the time, and nerds like myself, you know, already knew who he was. And then we had heard that they did the, you know, what, about a year and a half later, they did the fan in the stands intro that for him. Awesome. Would he, you know, That was so good because you know what? I was watching that as it happened on Saturday morning. Uh, I think it was Saturday morning. I don't think it was Wrestling Challenge on Superstars. And Ultimate Warrior was the biggest thing. And he's just coming off defeating Rick Rude and getting his title back. Even as a kid, as a nine-year-old, I'm like, oh, no, please don't do him feuding with Dino Bravo. Like, it just, <laughs> sound, just sounded awful. Like, I was nine, and I knew that somehow. And they did the fan in the stands thing, and it was the perfect building to do it in because you could almost see right up the stairs to him. Like, and he wasn't in the spotlight or anything. He stood out. Yeah. And as a kid, I remember thinking, oh, that guy. It has to be that guy. And he had the perfect, like, bashful fan reaction. And then he turned on the warrior. Well, because he had that face with the, the cheeks where he would like to smile and he was a happy guy. So he could look, you know, menacing, but he, he normally he looked cheerful. But were they in West Virginia? Because they announced him John or whatever from West Virginia. Um, you know, maybe so. Yeah. I think if they were in the Wheeling Civic Center, that, that building seems like that. But nevertheless... And they bring him in that way, but then boom, he's a heel and he's with Jimmy Hart. And that kind of illustrated, he had only been a pro at that point in time for like, what, not even two years and all in Japan. But, and at that size, almost 400 pounds, even when he was younger, six foot seven, he could move it around and he could work kind of. I'm not saying he wasn't doing, you know, fucking hip tosses and, you know, exchanging arm drags with people, but he could work kind of naturally, innately, especially for a guy that sized where he could do his shit and do it safely and at a top level early on in his career. Yeah, Hogan wouldn't have been working a feud with him if he couldn't work safely. No, no, especially at that fucking weight. That wouldn't work for him, brother. And he picked guys like that that could work. So that was a testimonial there. But, um, you know, that's, that's the thing is that was a memorable run from what was it? I think we just said 87 to what, 91 or 92. What? In, the, in WWF, you mean? Yes. He started in autumn of 1989. And oh, God, I'm sorry. I was at 87. Yeah. And then I know he was there in 94, but I think he left in between for a little bit. Yeah, he he had after the deal, the natural disasters with Thai food. Who <laughs> he's he's gonna be on every episode See, in some fashion or another. Is there's an example? He was great. His story was great. This is the sad story of John Ted that they just had to take a whole sidetrack just because they wanted to do the Shockmaster. The sh well, I <laughs> to do a whole big thing on that, which did not fit in the John Tenta story. Do that story. Well, but that's like in the middle of real time when, when Bill Maher does the, the comedy bit. You know, <laughs> they took it just for a second, we'll, and then we'll get back to the serious discussion. But anyway, yes, he then left and, and came back for a while, I think because he left and went back to Japan for a year or so. Because then the second, when he came back, that's when, you know, I first got to work with him up there. 
But nevertheless, uh, you know, unfortunately, even though he was a young guy, his time at, at, at the top was fairly brief. He's so memorable. But he's one of these guys people don't realize, you know, how short a time period it actually was because they think he may have always been around somewhere. And, you know, that's that was a shame because, you know, I... I don't want to when when they brought him back in whatever ninety seven or ninety eight Golga he was part of the oddities and Shitstein was in love with the Howard Stern show so they'd bring the weirdos to be with the oddities and they were fucking having Tourette's all over the place. I I get the idea Vince. I didn't know why because I said well here's this guy that can do this you certainly something else besides put him in a hood and dress him like a fucking mental patient. Just being earthquake would have had some value. Well, yeah, but I think Vince wanted Vince McMahon wanted to give him a job because he liked him and, you know, for past glory or, you know, fucking contributions or whatever, but he didn't really have any thought or effort of pushing him for whatever reason. <laughs> and 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 I was out of that picture by that point. So I was not prying. Because it would require me to be around shit stain even more. Yeah, it's so weird when you think about the attitude era. You never think about the fact that Earthquake was there. Yes. And he's under a, a fucking goofy mask and a goddamn set of pajamas with a Cartman doll. Yeah, which was briefly like the new Doink the Clown on the indie scene. There were plenty of bootleg <laughs> Golgas all over the place. <laughs> Golg. There. And then, boy, did you ever see the, the women's version, Golga My Ear? <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> so thank you folks tip the waitress and I'll be here twice on Friday. Um but back to China. But it, again, you know WCW he floated back and forth they made the shark and the fucking whatever the remember they also made Big Boss Man turned into the Guardian Angel. They just were just not only morally but creatively bankrupt over there and it's a shame that he didn't get Again, you know, more opportunities at the top because of that period of time in the business. Do you think the boss man should have just gone back to being Big Bubba Rogers right away? Well, it, I don't know why that that wasn't the first thing on everybody's mind. And I I think Bubba would, would have been fine with that, but I think the creative brain trust, blah, 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 whatever the fuck, they didn't, they kept trying to play off the uh, WWF gimmick in some law enforcement capacity instead of going back to what he had established on their own television network a mere, what, you know, four years previous. But I, I digress. But yeah, and then, the, you know, they told a story and, and we're going to have uh, an interview with Evan Husney on the experience this coming week about all the various episodes in season five. But they told a story about you know, him getting out of wrestling and he was uh, driving a truck and or selling clothes at the big and tall men's store, which I guess he would have, he should have been a spokesman, but I think he was a quiet guy and, you know, didn't rock too many boats and didn't go to the doctor to have something checked out until it was very late in the process. It turned out to be cancer, but Hey, the, uh, just, Ko the Koji Kateo match. What do you remember about oh, seeing it and hearing about it? Because you obviously were in the business. Um, well, and I was reading the, the rudimentary printed newsletters of the day, back when we all saw in black and white. What was that? 30 years ago? 32 years ago. 1992, I think. And it was a big deal that, uh, and you probably can help me out more on the details, but it was a co-promotion that... WWF had agreed to with SWS, which was, I'm going to say, Super World Sports. Was that That's it? That's right. Yes, right. And yeah. it was, there was a big, heavy hitting optish, optical company uh, of some description involved in bankrolling. The Tenaru was involved. Help me. Yes. Uh, it was actually the original version of AEW. A billionaire's <laughs> son. No, a, uh, a very rich man started a company, and it was a big deal because he stole Tenru. I say yeah. stole. He got Tenru from all Japan, which caused a whole chain of events to happen, which led to the elevation of Misawa a little earlier, maybe, than it was going to happen because they needed to get some guys in place because Tenru was gone. Well, and, there you go. And they had to deal with WWF. That's why Tenru was at WrestleMania 7 and the Royal Rumble and 
various things. He did like 20 minutes in the Royal Rumble once. Tenru, you well, never saw him ever. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes in the Rumble. Because you had to think that now Vince may have seen his in into expanding or taking over the Japanese market with this mark, money mark that's, um, you know, whatever, will be nice to him. And, and how long did SWS last? Do you remember? Uh, it lasted for a little couple of years, a few years. Remember, it was Tenru and Koji Katao against Demolition. They beat Demolition at WrestleMania 7 in LA. Oh my God, that's right. And if it wasn't for the price of security, that would have been at the sports arena. So, I mean, imagine what a big deal for the Japanese press that would have been. <laughs> um, uh, but nevertheless, yeah, that, kinda... Koji Katao and Tenta... Katow was another one of these guys. He, he I, I guess he probably prayed at the altar of Akira Maeda. He was disgusted with the Americanization and of wrestling and, and the fact that he was an ex-sumo guy who had attained a high level. And here was Tenta, who did a year or two, and he was getting put over and didn't want to do the job because it wasn't real and blah, blah, blah. All those various things that were going on in Japan during that era. And, you know, so they, he quit cooperating, whatever the fuck, and, and it broke down into, all right, Tenta said, come on, and, and Katow doing the fucking double Stooges eye poke motion, like, I'm going to poke, and he tried to poke him in the eyes, and Tenta blocked it and tried to kick him in the nuts, and Katow apparently decided at that moment he thought better of it, because this motherfucker looks menacing, and we don't really know. And he got out and got on the microphone and told everybody wrestling's fake and Tenta was a fucking cheater and stormed out and never wrestled again. He was used to being the biggest guy. He wasn't the biggest guy in there with Tenta. Yeah. And he was used to being a big deal in sumo and assumed it was going to be that way. And, and apart from this match, which degenerated and caused his early demise in the Japanese wrestling business... He wasn't getting rave reviews up to that point, was he? He was was he another like another Wajima? Oh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Eh, I was about to say I wouldn't do that to anyone, but he no, he sucked really bad. <laughs> 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 uh, and he was even worse at MMA. Uh, no, yeah, he was really bad. He did not work. He was a, I'd say a flash in the pan, but that may not even be the right word. But in and out quick, did not get it at all. But had this memorable moment, so we still talk about him. Yeah, so anyway, when that happened, it obviously spread back to the WWF locker room first because a bunch of the guys were there, and then it was in the sheets and spreading around the various territories. But yeah, the fucking earthquake had a shoot with a Japanese, you know, fucking martial arts guy or whatever the fuck they were calling him back then. And, uh, you know, that, but I think everybody in the business already knew you probably wouldn't want to just try to fuck John around in the ring at his size and with his background. He had been an amateur wrestling champion and, you know, uh, played legitimate sports and done sumo and blah, blah, blah. So nobody already thought he was a, you know, fucking pushover. But, uh, but anyway, it, it, it was a nice episode for once to, even though it was a sad story, you fall in love with the family. They're so, you know, just charming in every way. and. It was nice to hear his story told because a lot of people didn't know a lot of these things. And also it was a, a it, it, it was a dark side, but it was not of the person's own fault or making. So you got that going for you every once in a while. All right. Well, dark side of the ring had nothing to do with the dark side Maybe of the it, ring. It was, it was, it was, it was, there was the gray side of the ring. What do you think of Jericho as the narrator? Um, well, at least we don't have to look at him. He's got the perfect face for radio. Uh, and, and, and the uh, perfect know, he, voice to poke out he, your eardrums with a nice pick. He did, Well, he does a good job of reading what's, what's jotted down for him. But, uh, oh, yeah. it's, you know, if, uh, I will be, uh, I've lost my notes, but uh, Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern on Vice TV, I'll be coming up in the next few weeks uh, with some some wonderful, pithy commentary on a particular subject. And of course, that subject Would is... be a, a wonderful. Will be wonderful. Yes. And potentially you'd want to call someone and tell them about it. 
So call somebody with Mint Mobile. Well, what you got to do is you got to get on your Mint Mobile and you got to call somebody. And you got to tell them that Jim Cornette's going to be on the television. But if you don't have the Mint Mobile, ladies and gentlemen and Mr. TV announcer, if you don't have the Mint Mobile, then you're going to be up shit creek without a paddle. Have you ever thought, Brian, about why the heck, with all the things that they can do with the space age technology these days, that your wireless bill, your, your cellular phone, the thing that you communicate with, or that most people do, of course, everybody knows I'm against them, but nevertheless, I'm losing that battle. Why is it so gall darn expensive? Because it's ready, they, they transmit television signals through the air, and you can pick them up with these newfangled antennas they got for free. It's, it's, it's radio waves. It's, it's, it's light and sound that travels through the air. Why does it have to be so gosh dang expensive? I'll tell you why, Brian Last. That's because all these big companies got together, the ones that are putting up the towers all over the place that are beaming signals into your brains on a constant basis. They decided, yeah, these people pay 100 bucks a month, maybe 125 maybe 150 but Mint Mobile, oh, no, no, you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, oh, contraire, mon frere, and they're going to say, we can send you these signals that go through the existing airwaves and light waves, and we can do it for only $15 a month. That's because it's probably not really costing anything, but at least Mint Mobile ain't fucking you as bad as these other people are fucking you. And they're building their towers. They're not fucking you. They're not fucking you at all. And well, they're, they and they're not building anything. Head. They're just building relationships with the consumer by delivering wonderful service. Well, see, they don't have these big towers that stick straight up in the air. It costs a fortune to build them. See, they're building their shit on the ground. That way, you don't have to bring in the big heavy equipment. They just start and go sideways. They are and on that the way ground. It's a hundred feet long instead of a hundred feet high. It's cheaper to build. And then they just beam the signal right out the top, right to your phone. They are on the ground working with the people. The, yes. The people of America, the common man, <laughs> and delivering great phone service. So let me reiterate that once again, with a great price. Yeah, well, did I mention that? Starting at $15 a month, you can have a wireless plan, and you can get wires if you pay a little more. That is unlimited talk and text plus data for $15 a month. And I'm, so there you've got the talking ability, you've got the texting ability, and you got the, the data-ing ability. And it's, it's premium wireless. It says so right here in the copy. And all the plans come with the, the high-speed data. It's not even just data. They get it to you quick. You tell them what you want, boom, it's high-speed coming right back at you. Well, here's your data. And you can choose from a three, a six, or a 12-month plan and say goodbye to a monthly phone bill. And hello to a three or a six or a 12-month phone bill. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or whether if you're expecting a baby. You know, all babies have to have phones. And they've got special now prenatal phones where you can buy them. They're waterproof and you can pop them no, right no, there. <laughs> no, you can't. They do not have that. They will not have that. I thought that way the kids get practice. That's not the way the kids get practice. And you probably, ladies and gentlemen, shouldn't have your kids on a cell phone. Too young could develop some bad habits. They got to be at least 18 months. Well, at Mint Mobile, family start at two lines. That's one for, for mom and one for dad. Then you can add one for the divorce attorney. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. If you want to still use that probably germ-infested thing you keep in your ass all the time, right? Right, so You're sitting on it, constantly farting at it. But, you what? know, if, if you don't want a new one, it's up to you. And you can switch to Mint Mobile right now and get your first three months of premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month right now. Here's how you do it. You will go to mintmobile.com slash J-C-E to get your new wireless plan for $15 a month, get the plan shipped to your door for free. You don't even have to pay for somebody to bring it over to you. If you go to mintmobile.com slash JCE, cut the wireless bill, cut the wire on the wireless bill. 
and and save a stamp while you're at it and and save a horse ride a cowboy mintmobile.com slash jce and just pop that thing right up there don't do that but check out mint mobile friends of the show they can be friends of yours mint mobile what's that promo code one more time jim slash jce that's right if only if only <laughs> 